Golden Radio Hour. This is Nightline, your tie line to the world, and this is Walter O'Keefe. Tonight, a visit to worlds strangely different from ours, the world of the future, the world of X minus one. Now, here is the future, X minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Death Wish by Ned Lang. But first, hear this. During the theater season in New York, people flock from everywhere in the nation to see the latest Broadway plays. But very few of these people have ever been fortunate enough to experience the thrill and excitement backstage at one of Broadway's top musical comedies. Tomorrow night, Monitor invites you along as Don Russell goes backstage at the Broadway musical hit Simply Heavenly, introducing you to the cast, the author listening to the songs from this fine musical show. It'll be an experience you won't soon forget. Then on Saturday, for sports enthusiasts, Army versus Notre Dame, and Monitor brings you this football classic direct from Municipal Stadium in Philadelphia. Add to these features Monitor's special coverage of the pomp, ceremony, and celebration during Queen Elizabeth's tour of Canada. Visits from celebrities like Mickey Rooney, Tennessee Williams, Tony Bennett, and Burl Ives, and you have some idea of the top variety of entertainment Monitor will bring you all weekend. So start your weekend right with Monitor on Friday night and stay with Monitor all weekend long over most of these same NBC radio stations. And now, X-1 and tonight's story, Death Wish. Fuel consumption normal. We'll reach Point Able in 10 seconds from now. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Cut. Well, gentlemen, we're on our way to Mars. Now, Mr. Ratchet, give me a 30-second warning before we reach Point Baker. Very well, Captain. Now, Mr. Watkins, what's the condition of your engines? Don't you worry about my engines. The Deidre may be a cantankerous old crate, but she's good for another five or ten round trips to Mars. You can lay to that. <laughs> Look at him, Captain. <laughs> if anybody criticizes his engines, you can actually see that walrus mustache of his bristle. Listen, Rachek, I've had about enough of these personal remarks of yours. Stick to your navigation and let me alone. Now, now, Watkins, let's not get into another of those arguments. Now, that's an order. Aye, sir. You had a reason for asking about your engines. I've made enough trips to Mars to know the way a ship should sound. There's something about this one. I don't know quite what. There's nothing wrong with this ship, Captain Summers. I'll tell you something, though, every engineer worth his salt knows. There are just two kinds of equipment. The kind that fails bit by bit, and the kind that goes all at once. When something happens to the Deidre, you'll know it right away. You won't have to ask. Well, maybe so. But I wonder if our cargo didn't shift on the takeoff. Uh, Mr. Ratchick, would you be kind enough to check on it? You bet, Captain, right away. You worried about that new Ferenson computer we're carrying, Captain? Well, not worried exactly, but it's a responsibility. 
That thing is by far the largest, heaviest, most delicate piece of machinery ever transported in space. It's an evil thing. With its blinking eyes and scheming brain. I'll be glad to get to Marsport and get it off the ship. And so will I, Watkins, but uh, not quite for the same reason. I don't quite share your feelings about the personality of machines. That's because you don't know anything about them, Captain. I do. And I don't like that computer thing back there in the hole. All in order in the hole, boss. Cargo hasn't shifted. All right, Mr. Ratchet. Maybe I'm borrowing trouble, hmm? Uh, 30 seconds to Point Baker, sir. Very well. Uh, strap yourselves on the acceleration couches again. You sure you don't read anything, Mr. Watkins? Not a thing, sir. I'll vouch for every bit of equipment on the Deidre. Fifteen seconds to Point Baker. Prepare for new acceleration. Engines ready for firing, sir. Ten, nine, eight. We fire seven, for exactly five seconds six, on reaching Point Baker five, for maximum acceleration. Four, three, two, one, fire! That's five. It didn't cut off. We're overfiring. My fuel. The course. We'll be off course. The switch doesn't respond. Emergency cut off. Hit the emergency. I can't move my arms. Acceleration. Stop it. Stop the rockets. My arms. So heavy. If I could just reach. Cut off switch. There. What happened? We're on emergency lights. We blew the generator. Of all the lousy things to happen. Well, what was it? Main firing circuit. A fused on us. Metal fatigue, I'd say. Must have been flawed for years. When was it last checked out? Well, it's a sealed unit, Captain. It's supposed to outlast the ship. Absolutely foolproof. Unless unless... it's flawed. Now, don't go blaming it on me. Those circuits are supposed to be X-rayed, heat-treated, fluoroscoped. You just can't trust machinery. How are we on fuel? Not enough to push a kiddie car down Main Street. If I could just get my hands on those factory inspectors... Mr. Ranchik, how does this affect our course? I'm computing it now. hurry it up. I'm working as fast as I can. Mr. Watkins, can we fire those rockets on manual? Sure we can. But we only have enough fuel for about a three-second burst. It'll mean a crash landing. We'll worry about that when we come to it. Well, Mr. Ratchick, this kills us, Captain. We're going to cross the orbit of Mars before Mars gets there. How long? Too long. Captain, we're flying out of the solar system at just under the speed of light. You're listening to Death Wish, tonight's attraction on X-1. Now back to X-1 and Death Wish. Look at him. Look at how he sits there staring at nothing. Here we are, kiting off into space, and what do you do? We got a little fuel left. We can turn the ship, can't we? Look, you are a navigator, aren't you? I am, Mr. Watkins. And for your information, if I plotted my courses the way you maintain your engines, we'd be plowing into the middle of Australia right now. Why, you little company toady. At least I got my job honestly. Not by marrying the owner's daughter. Why, you dirty old man. Stop it. it. Stop it, both of you. No more of this now. I give the orders here. All right, then give some. Tell him to plot a return curve. This is life and death. All the more reason for keeping our heads. Mr. Ratchet, can you plot such a course? The first thing I tried. On the fuel we got left, there isn't a chance. Best I could do would be a degree or two. That won't help. What do you mean it won't? We'll turn back into the solar system. Sure, but the best curve we can make will take us a few thousand years to complete. What about a landfall on some other planet? Uh, Neptune, Uranus? Impossible. In the first place, the right planet would have to be in the right place at the right time. And if it were, we'd need fuel, a lot of fuel, to get into a breaking orbit. And if we could, who'd come and get us? No ship has gone past Mars yet. Yeah, but maybe there'd be a chance, just a slim chance. Maybe, maybe, but we can't swing it. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we'll have to kiss the solar system goodbye. It just doesn't seem possible. Who would believe we're traveling at almost the speed of light? Look out the viewing port. You'd swear we were standing still in space. Yeah, that's because there's no reference point, as you know. I assure you, we're traveling faster than any men have ever traveled. What should we do, Captain? I don't know, Watkins. I just don't know. (laughs) Our noble captain can't face the situation. Of course I can face it. I can follow any course you plot. That's my only real responsibility. Now let's get a grip on ourselves. Mr. Ajik, suppose you raise Mars on the radio. Aye, aye, sir. 
Deidre to Marsport. Deidre to Marsport. Urgent. Repeat, urgent. Come in, Marsport. Marsport to Deidre. Read you. Over. Emergency, Marsport. Firing mechanism jammed. Fuel almost totally expended. Acceleration 15 seconds past safe maximum. Heading out of solar system. Request help. Over. Can you turn the ship, Deidre? Can you put it into any kind of an orbit? Over. No fuel, Marsport. We can only turn a degree or two. Over. Put your captain on, Deidre. Over. Captain Summers, Marsport. Over. Captain, what do you propose to do? Good Lord, man, that's what we're asking you. What do you propose to do? I say, what do you propose to What are they saying? I don't know. I couldn't catch it. Mr. Radjic, can't you get better reception? We're rapidly running out of range, Captain. I'll give it all the gain I can get. To Deidre. Marsport to Deidre. Can you read me? There they are. Shut up. Deidre, what can you do for us? Over. Captain, we can't think of a thing. If you could swing into any sort of orbit. We can't. I told you that. Under the circumstances, Captain, you have the right to try anything at all. Anything, Captain. Oh, that's nice of them. What do they expect us to do, complain to the company? Listen, Marsport. Marsport, do you still read me? Over. Read you faintly. Go on, but hurry. I can think of just one thing. We could bail out in space suits as near Mars as possible. The Diana is laying over there, isn't she? You could have her pick us up. Over. Sorry, Captain. You're confused. If you left your ship, your momentum would not be affected. You and your crew would continue through space at the same rate as the ship. Over. Of course. I wasn't thinking. I have it. Send the Diana out to intersect our course. Maybe we can find some way to transfer. My navigator will help you plot the intersection. Over. They've gone again. Hello, Marsport. Hello, Marsport. Come in, Marsport. I can't bring them in again. To do it that way, sorry. Over. You mean you can't do it? Why not? It is our only chance. Over. Diana's laid up, having her engines overhauled. How long before she can be space-born? Too long. Three weeks. Sorry, Captain. I wish we could think of something. But the only thing we can suggest... What? I didn't get it. Reception's gone again, Captain. We're getting out of range. I don't know whether I can raise them again or not. Well, try, try. Come on, maybe that suggestion uh, what is... What can it... they suggest that we don't already know? Uh, even the static's getting weaker now. We only knew what they were going to say. What's the difference? They didn't really think it would work anyhow. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. Maybe something come. Hold it. Suggest. Can you hear? Suggest. Most unlikely. But try. Try calculator. Try calculate. They're gone. For good this time. I heard what he said. The calculator. Does he mean the Farrenson computer in our hole? Yes. Yes, I see what he meant. The Farrenson's a very advanced job. No one knows the limits of its potential. He suggests we present our problem to it. Ah, that's ridiculous. The problem has no solution. It doesn't seem to, but the big computers have solved other problems that seem to have no solution. Now, we can't lose anything by trying. No, not as long as we don't pin any hopes on it. That's right. We don't dare hope. Mr. Watkins, I believe this is your department. Ah, what's the use... You say don't hope, but both of you are hoping anyhow. You think the big electronic god is going to save your lives? Well, it's not. Well, we have to try, man. Who says we do? I wouldn't give it the satisfaction of turning us down. Are you implying that machines think? You bet I am, because they do. No, I'm not out of my head. Any engineer will tell you that a complex machine has a personality all its own. Do you know what that personality is like? It's cold. Withdrawn, uncaring, unfeeling. A machine's only purpose is to frustrate desire and produce two problems for every one it solves. 
And do you know why a machine feels this way? You're hysterical. Oh, no, I'm not. A machine feels this way because it knows it's an unnatural creation in nature's domain. It wants to reach entropy and cease. It's a death wish. A mechanical death wish. Gibberish. Watkins, are you going to hook up that computer? Oh, sure, I'm human. I keep trying. I just wanted you to understand that there's no hope. I'll get it warmed up. We better watch him. He'll be all right. Maybe. He's blaming the situation on a machine personality now, trying to absolve himself of guilt. It's his fault we're in this spot. An engineer's responsible for all equipment. What's the good of blaming anybody? <sighs> None, I guess. Eh, personally, I don't much care. This is as good a way to die as any. Better than most. Don't talk like that. Why not? Death in space is an appealing idea in certain ways. Imagine... An entire spaceship for a tomb. And you uh, you have a certain choice in how you die. Thirst, um, hunger, heat, cold... Shut up! Now that's an order. <laughs> this is your first real emergency, Captain. And you're responding like a stunned ox. Wake up! You can't live with joy. At least try to extract a little pleasure out of your die. Shut your mouth! Well, gents, your little tin god's ready and waiting... Anybody care to make a burnt offering in front of it? Have you given it the problem? Most of it. Uh, you two have to punch up your own details. Position, elapsed time from maximum acceleration, water, oxygen, food. All right. Come on, Ratchik. Did you tell it we want to return to Earth alive? Oh, yes, yes, it loves that part. <laughs> It'll get such pleasure out of rejecting the problem as unsolved. Oh, no, 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 it won't say that. It'll say, uh... Uh, insufficient data. And I'll punch up the rest of the information. <laughs> insufficient data. You see the point? It hints a solution is possible, but just out of reach. A subtle torture. It can keep us hoping. There. That's the complete picture. Now let's see what happens when I press this. Now just keep your eye on that red light up there. If it goes on, it means a problem is rejected. Watch it now. And if it solves it? That's a little bell, sort of like a typewriter bell. Oh, but you won't hear it, don't worry. Don't say that. What's the matter, Roderick? Superstition? Oh, shut up. You two have to keep up that everlasting wrangling. Well, not for long, Captain. We haven't much longer to live, Captain. Maybe that's good. What's that? A, a, a solution. It's found a solution. That must be a mistake. There is no solution. It's fooling us, leading us on. Now who's superstitious? Here. Here's the tape. The solution's on this. Well, what's it say? Come on, come on, read it, read it. No, not me. You read it, Captain. I won't play its fiendish game. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's fine. That's just fine. Well, what does it say, for the love of heaven? You figured a few thousand years to return to the solar system, Ratchik? Well, the computer agrees. 2,300 years, to be precise. Therefore, it has given us the formula for a longevity serum. 2,300 years? What are we supposed to do, hibernate? Not at all. As a matter of fact, the serum does away quite neatly with the need for sleep. But 2,300 years, gentlemen. We three sit here in this little ship and look at each other. 2,300 years of that! Yeah. Yeah, that's just the sort of thing a machine would do. Fred Collins again. And I'll have another word for you about X-1 in a moment. That how you feel, blue and miserable with a deep-down cold? Listen. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Millions more take bromoquinine. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Bromoquinine. More people have taken more bromoquinine cold tablets for more complete relief than any other cold tablet ever sold. 
You could use aspirin or cough syrups or nose drops all day and not get bromoquinine's relief. Bromoquinine works to relieve stopped-up nose, body aches, fever, irregularity, the blues, and headache, too. Yes, more complete relief for even virus colds. For bromoquinine is the only cold tablet sold with wonder-working quinine and five medicines health fortified with vitamin C. Remember, every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Millions more take bromoquinine. Get bromoquinine brand cold tablets. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features You Were Right, Joe, by J.T. McIntosh. The story of a time traveler who, going into the future, hardly expected to encounter a Neanderthal man. Read it in Galaxy Magazine on your newsstand today. X-1 has brought you Death Wish, a story written by Ned Lang and adapted for radio by William Welch. Featured in our cast were Ralph Camargo as Watkins, Maurice Tarplin as Captain Summers, Walter Black as Ratchek, and Joseph Bell as the radioman. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by George Vutsas and is an NBC Radio Network production. There's excitement in the air at night, and Nightline brings it to you. Hear Nightline with Walter O'Keefe next on most of these NBC stations. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.